animals are amazing. You guys remember back when uh, Discovery was our parent company and we all got a DVD collection of uh, Planet Earth, was it called? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, with, with Daddy Davey narrating in his dulcet tones. <laughs> right. Uh, this this uh, excellent documentary series is one of many things that inspired us a while back to ask a question. Are there any unknown large animals out there? We know that there are new uh, species of a lot of small animals discovered in the modern day, but what about the big stuff? Any big cats, you know, any, any um, Lovecraftian? Lizards. Yeah, lizards, Lovecraftian monsters in the deep. And if so, why aren't we finding their poop or bones? <laughs> That's the question, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I don't know. Uh, let's get into it. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel Gorilla Boy Brown. They Ooh. call me Ben, you are you, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, that's a that's an interesting moniker, and it's uh, Gorilla Boy has taken the uh, office by storm. That's what my girlfriend calls me. Yeah, it's just weird that she does it in front of other people. But, you know, if you're happy, you're happy. I think she means it as a compliment. I think so. I think because she says it with a note of admiration. And yeah, it's because I'm really mad good at sign language. <laughs> oh, I thought it was the chest ear. Yeah, that too. So we're talking today about something we've returned to often in the show, and that is cryptids, right? We are, let's be honest, folks. We're living in a world where there's ecological collapse. Can you do it in a movie trailer voice? Sure. <clears throat> in a world on the verge of ecological collapse, three men, oh, four counting their super producer Tristan. And one gorilla boy. Wait, now we no, have five too many, people. Too many men. <laughs> we have five people. Uh, okay, so we've talked about this before, and one of the big quests for the human species has always been a quest of discovery, right? What can we find at the edges of the map? The thing most people want to find, the real fun stuff, would be, of course, a cryptid. But what is a cryptid? Yeah, that's a fun term, but what does it mean, right? Well, it's an umbrella term that describes a whole host of different types of creatures that are all rumored to exist. This is very important that it's rumored. There's no scientific proof of the existence of these creatures, but the fascination it still remains, right? And the study of cryptids is known as cryptozoology. Gosh, that's fun to say. And uh, <laughs> we have a much older exploration of this. One of the first episodes we ever did was an update or not an update, I guess it was an exploration of our videos on cryptozoology, Ben? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cryptozoology show notes. Uh, just for a quick recap to give everybody uh, the lay of the land. Oh, and Matt, you have your Mothman shirt on today. I, I just noticed did. that. I did it on purpose. You got Gorilla Boy, Mothman, Tristan, we'll get to you. I didn't mean that to sound so menacing. We'll find a nickname. But you're next, buddy. You're next. Uh we got to let the badger out of the bag here. Cryptozoology is, at the very least, a controversial field. The vast majority of scientists and any other related subjects, uh, zoologists, biologists, ecologists, and so on, think that cryptozoology is essentially a pseudoscience. Yeah, a lot of times these scientists with a capital S believe that the cryptozoologists suffer from confirmation bias, from believing so wholeheartedly that these things exist, they will take evidence that they find and kind of make it tell the story that they wish it to be. Sort of cherry pick, right? Like, mm -hmm. like if I, like a zoologist would say there are rumors of uh, Gorilla Boy out in the wild. Yeah. Let's see if it's true. And their critique is that, or their criticism rather, is that a cryptozoologist instead would say, I know Gorilla Boy is real. I will find the evidence that supports this. Yeah, it's that whole getting caught up in the thrill of the hunt thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, throughout the centuries, various uh, experts have investigated claims of previously unidentified animals. And every year, the search for new organisms continues. 
But, but what sort of animals would be considered cryptids? I mean, you can describe almost anything, you know, as a cryptid that fits in the following categories. So we've got um, subjects of eyewitness accounts, historically located uh, creatures from specific region or regions. And most importantly, they are they have to be this. You know, this is kind of the kicker. They have to not be acknowledged by the scientific community. So, yes, right. there's AKA not a species imaginary. <laughs> yeah. So they uh so we would have, you know, we would have like old man Frederick saying, I've lived in these woods for now and fifty years, and every moonless night the skunk ape comes out of the swamps. He does come out of them swamps, and I tell you what, when I'm on that porch sitting out there, mm-hmm. you'll hear the whisper of the wind, you hear them hear them grasshopper. Oh, this is getting weird, this accent right here. <laughs> weird me weird me out really bad. I just want to take a moment to say this is one of those things, the things I just said about yeah. them being imaginary where some folks ding us or me or whatever for like not believing fully in the things that we describe. But that's not the point. This stuff is fascinating to think about and there are obviously more compelling examples than others. I just wanted to throw that out there. I don't think yeah, that that's by fair. and large cryptids are imaginary, but I just think it's funny that one of the categories that they need to fit in is that they are not scientifically acknowledged to exist. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And it's a weird thing because once they are acknowledged, uh then they become no longer a cryptid. So this this weird umbrella term applies more to the position of a proposed organism, right? Because once it's a genuine scientifically acknowledged organism, then it's just, it's not mysterious anymore. It just goes in the books of creatures. It's just a, a stink bird or a skunk ape. Skunk yeah. ape is a cryptid, isn't that a great name? Yeah. So the 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 outlines that Noel provided, the categories there perfectly incorporate all the famous cryptids, you know, like the big uh, blockbuster cryptids, uh, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster. Godzilla. Godzilla. <laughs> <I'm> still <laughs> out on the loose. Yeah. I don't know if that fits in, but maybe. Maybe. Well, Godzilla uh, came from the ocean, right? Yes. And, and a creature did. of that size could easily could easily disappear into the ocean. Yeah, I want to say, too, real quick, not to get too derailed, but some of the most bizarre and fascinating creatures that border on seeming as close to, like, extraterrestrials as we're ever going to get mm-hmm. come from the deep, deep ocean. I don't know if you've ever seen that Planet Earth episode oh, yes. about the deep, dark ocean. The fizzle plane. It's insane. They look, they've got, like, mm. weird, like, little lamps hanging on their foreheads and stuff. They look like something out of a nightmare. And they're very otherworldly because they exist under such extreme pressures. Right. And they have right. to have that adaptation that allows them to flourish, more or less, in this bizarre and lightless environment. Well, and we're going to get to that a little later, I believe. Yes, uh, because this, I'm glad that we said this, because this definition also incorporates, along with the really strange things like gigantic snakes, dragons, relic dinosaur populations, and other allegations, the definition of cryptid also incorporates animals that you might not think of, like relic populations of animals that were formerly thought to be extinct, such as the coelacanth, mm-hmm. right? Everybody thought, well, everybody in, here we go with the scientific racism as well, everybody in Western Europe thought that the coelacanth was extinct, despite the vast amounts of native populations going, oh, yeah, that fish has always been here, and it sucks to eat. <laughs> yeah. eat it. But then, you know, these scientists, finger quote, air quote, discovered it, and now it's not a cryptid. This could also be animals that look very similar to known creatures, yet are different enough to qualify as their own species. That's happening a lot with uh, DNA testing now. But let's face it. Let's wake up, smell the Folgers, face the facts. The holy grail of possible cryptids has never been a small new species of bottlenose blue fly or the cousin of the finch with a separate color palette. Oh, no. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And that means what people want to find are big creatures. The Godzillas. The Godzillas. The King Kongs, right? The Cthulhus, you know? Cthulhu is kind of a proto Godzilla in a lot of ways. I mean, he he came from beneath the the oceans deep, and mm. you know, rose up to crush us all. Yeah, but there, no, nobody wants to find that, right? Please tell me nobody wants to find the one who won't be named. I'm down. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of Lovecraft. Uh, in the at least the mythology. Yeah. 
but none of nothing about his real life. He was a terrible, terrible person. But okay, but just to get back on here, yeah, the idea of this creature is that it causes other utter madness, right? That's right. the idea. Yeah. Just it's an even thinking minds. about it causes madness. So why would you want to find one or it or he, she, whatever just to, they? You know, just push, push the boundaries. Yeah. Oh, all right, it's be be more hardcore. Okay, cool. Because what is life if not to be lived? All right. Right. Did our fortune cookie arguments persuade you? I'm persuaded. Uh, so you're right, though. People want big animals. People want to find krakens, abominable snow folk, thunderbirds, dragons, dinosaurs. Did you say snow folk? Uh-huh. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It's, well, it's 2017, you know. It can't, it's not just a bunch of snow dudes out there in the Himalayas, one would hope. Yeah. But th- that's a big question. Are there really any large animals out there? And if so, how could we find them? Well, we find them through an impulse that has been with our species as long as we've been around is this search for other life, whether it's on our planet or elsewhere. So the current age of man, the Anthropocene, puts our species in a uniquely fortuitous and particularly perilous time um, in our search for undiscovered species. So due to the spreading of our species across areas, vast areas of the world previously forbidden to us, we've got the technology and the wherewithal to go to places we would not have normally been able to go in our formative (laughs) times, let's say. yeah. Yeah. So as a result of that propagation, we're also kind of collapsing ecosystems. Not kind of. No, yeah, totally doing that thing at a alarming and, dare we say, catastrophic rate, which means that we are totally racing ourselves Mm. to discover animals that may already be extinct by the time we get to them. Yeah, so I think that's a very, very good point. So we're more capable of going to the hinterlands of Antarctica, right, to Mm. the bottom of the seafloor or... Sorry. Yeah, that's perfect. To deep, uh, to deep caves, you know, and, and to space to all these places we could ordinarily never go. So we're more likely to find stuff that's there if we get to it before our pollution does, essentially. We're also very much in the dark about just how many species remain out there in the wild. This blows my mind. We don't know exactly what we will discover. In the insect realm, there are hundreds of thousands of unidentified species, and the brutal math of the equation ensures that many of them will vanish before anyone finds and identifies them, including, like, native populations. So not just, you know, ivory tower scientists, but uh, tribes, that are largely uncontacted, may not even be able to identify all of the varieties of moth in their region. That's weird to think about. In 2011, the Census of Marine Life estimated that Earth is home to about 8.7 million species, give or take 1.3 million. You know, you got it when you make a big number like that and you're estimating the number of species, especially how many could or could not exist. Uh You got to give it a a bit of an error, a margin of error. A little wiggle room. But uh, but this number ultimately breaks down to 6.5 million different species on land and 2.2 million different species in the ocean. And if we count microbes, my goodness, that number skyrockets. So let's jump to 2016 when researchers at Indiana University estimated that there might be between 100 billion and one trillion species of microbes out there, just kicking it with us, just hanging out, you know, on our skin, just on that leaf over there. No, it's, it's like if you ever get a chance to see those, that microscopic photography of gut bacteria or of like these various microbes. And I mean, it's like fractals inside fractals. It's like mm. these worlds within worlds that we cannot possibly even contemplate. Like, that's insane to me. And then you think about our position in, you know, the universe and in the planet. And then as it relates to that, it's just like uh, more than more than the mind can even. Wrap yes. Itself around. If you have not read The Filth, uh, read mm-hmm. the graphic novel The Filth today. It also brings to mind super symmetry. You know, when you Ooh. consider that our each of our bodies are comprised more of other life forms than human cells. Mm hmm. We're outnumbered, I think, that there are five bacterial cells for every human cell in your body. But the the size ratio 
is yes, size is matters very here. Different, right? <laughs> right. But but you're it's absolutely right with the numbers. Human cells are are much larger, and it's strange. You know, we're all agglomerations of things. We're all much more like cities in our way than we are individuals. But we also shouldn't forget that there is still a ton of Earth left to explore. I mean, technological advancements have been just huge in in this respect. Satellites, LIDAR, drones, all given us this glimpse into hitherto unexplored regions, remote, you know, um, inhospitable Mm -hmm. that we never would have been able to lay eyes on, let alone take readings from and learn Mm -hmm. about the makeup of the, you know, materials and the climates and the various conditions of these places. Yes, but again, what about the big stuff? Could a large animal, let's say the size of a a, a Labrador. How about a Labradoodle? Um, all right, yeah, I can do Labradoodle. Uh, a Labradoodle or up. Or maybe maybe even, you know what, let's raise the stakes. Something the size of a horse, perhaps. Okay. Could it remain undiscovered for the entire span of human civilization? That's a tough one. And I think we're going to have to look at that after a quick word from our sponsor. You rascal. Here's where it gets crazy. So what's the answer? It's possible. It what? really is. Yeah. No uh well we're a family show, so uh no no tuckus. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. I used to have a boss who said, I want you to give me the straight poop. <laughs> Oh. Give me the, like, like, like saying the, the dish, you know, give me the stuff. Yeah, the like, tell me poop. the truth. Give me the straight poop. Was it a cool boss? No. It was no. awful. But straight poops are pretty cool phrase. I think it's a, like a northern thing. He was from like Pennsylvania oh, or yeah. something. Yeah. Well, write in and let us know if you are from a part of the world where people say straight poop. But it really is. Uh, we'll give you the straight poop here. It really is possible that an entire group of large animals has escaped the notice of humanity at large. And just a side note. I think I'm going to stick with Tuckus. So every time I was going to say a, uh, wait, is Tuckus butt? Is that what that yeah, means? Yes, yes. Uh, and it's Tuckus, technically. Yes. Uh, okay, I'm going to, you know what? I've committed to it. I'm just going to, I'm going to ride this pony into the sunset. I like it. Ride this cryptid into the sunset. There are big obstacles to this concept, even though it is possible. Um, we have to consider something that we've looked at in the past when we specifically examined, uh, say, Bigfoot mm-hmm. or large the rumors of dinosaurs in African forest, the thing is a large animal needs a lot of energy and it would probably have a measurable impact on an observable ecosystem that would be in proportion to or commensurate with its size. So one great example of this is whenever a whale dies and it sinks to the seabed and it becomes this sort of funereal rotting oasis for the creatures of the deep yeah it's like that story that came out not too long ago out of indonesia where there was this these photographs and video of what looks like a loch ness monster type thing or some kind of crazy you know sea elephant or something and it turns out it's just the carcass the gelatinous molten carcass of a baleen whale i believe Mm -hmm. but it starts to contort and stretch and do all this bizarre stuff and yeah whale skulls look rather odd when all the stuff's peeled back from it right i i think that's a very it's a very polite way to say it i will i will say they they look fascinating and terrifying in a way imagine looks like tusks yeah imagine living thousands of years ago and then discovering these bones that would wash up on shore. You know? It's interesting, though, in, the, in an article in Live Science uh, relating to the sighting I was just talking about, a um, whale biologist by the name of Alexander Wirth, there's an interesting quote here that I think pertains to our discussion. He says, quote, There is lots of stuff in the ocean that we don't know about, but there's nothing that big that remains unknown. Hmm. That's, yeah, and that's the thing because that's a controversial... Um, that's still a point of contention. Obviously, one man's opinion, but it's, you know. But he is an expert. Yeah. He's not like just some guy who's hanging out selling koozies and speedos. He's not a whale yeah. hobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a whale enthusiast. Uh, yeah, it's, it's true though. It's, uh, it's true on land that large animals would have likely already been observed by humans or in areas where they would come into contact with humans, they might have already been hunted to death died due to pollution or become unable to compete for their normal breeding territory, their food of choice, other resources. Uh, This happens. Look at the woolly mammoth. Uh, Mm -hmm. They may also 
become unable to accomplish annual migrations. And this is, in effect, another death sentence, just a slower one. Yeah. Uh, just to really fast get back to the amount of energy that a mm-hmm. cryptid would require. So there are a couple of things that just come come to my mind when we're thinking about this. So if you're thinking about a singular animal, right? Okay. And then you think about how much food that animal will, will require. You have to think, is it an herbivore, an omnivore? Does it eat mm-hmm. primarily meat? Right. And then think about how much energy, like we said, that would require to eat. Then imagine this thing isn't alone. If there is a Bigfoot, there is a family of Bigfoots, unless they're, you know, they live forever, Mm -hmm. right? Or whatever uh, animal it is, a horse-sized creature. Yes. There's going to be a herd at least of them that has survived over the centuries. It reminds me of that band name, And You Will Know Us By Our Trail of Dead. Oh, yeah, And You Will Know Us By The Trail of the Dead. Well, yeah, sure. And maybe it's just grass that's getting eaten or some plant that exists out in the middle of nowhere. But, you know... There's going to be a, a big uh, hole of resources where these things survive. Right, right. And despite all these problems, all these very valid, let's call them cons, to the argument mm-hmm. for a large animal, uh, we have one big pro on the other side. That is that the world is enormous. There are still a few places where it's possible that humanity could discover something the size of a Labrador, a Labradoodle, or larger. In fact, it's more possible now than at any other point in human history. So we can look at different regions of the world uh, and see whether what would be the most or least likely to harbor an undiscovered large life form. So our first stop on this journey would be to the jungles and the massive forests of Mm -hmm. the planet. Mm -hmm. Once these things span entire continents, they just nothing but trees as far as the eye could see. Mm-hmm. But now, because of manufacturing and agricultural techniques, these things have been drastically reduced, both in, in terms of their size uh, and the biodiversity within their ecosystems. So a lot of the animals have been dying off. We are inside a mass die-off right now of species, and we've been kind of ramping up to that right. over the past few hundred years. Paleontologists will tell you that we are we are officially in the sixth great extinction in the history of this planet. Mm-hmm. This is like dinosaur leveling stuff, you know. Um, maybe not as sudden as a impact event, right? Sure, but in many ways as as lethal. And this is not look. This is not in any way involved with. Um, political standpoints or ideologies. This no. is this is just hard science. There are resources that we use that we extract and one of those is wood and trees and that's what we've been doing for a long time and humanity's been expanding. It's just kind of the way we've been going. I'm sort of torn on the point too where people say that we should stop as a species from uh pursuing agriculture, right? Because it keeps people alive. So at what point do we stop letting people eat? You know what I mean? Or stop letting people reproduce. Yeah, or stop letting people choose what they want to eat, right? Because if the entire world went vegetarian, there's that argument that uh, the there would be less pollution and that there would also be uh, more food for people. Those vertical farms, man, we got to start getting those. Yeah, but I am a... I am just a, a walking garbage disposal. I haven't really met food that I wouldn't eat. I've met some that I didn't like. You have a whole show where you just eat trash food. Uh, you true. guys, uh, anybody who's listening to this and doesn't uh, have access to the How Stuff Works Facebook page, I just have to throw this out here right now. Ben and uh, someone who's been on our show before, Lauren Vogelbaum, they do a show called Snack Stuff. And yesterday, during the live broadcast, Ben... Not only did he eat canned rattlesnake, <clears throat> and Lauren, both they both did, mm-hmm. uh, they took a shot of rattlesnake can juice at the end of it's it. It's like a gravy. It's disgusting. That is foul. The That's look bad. on poor Ben's face. It was bad. Oh. It was really bad. So uh, the rattlesnake itself doesn't taste bad. The, the texture is really similar to like pulled pork. I just don't like chicken. stuff out of a can. Yeah? Can, can stuff weirds me out. Potted meat. Canned stuff in general? Yeah. 
I mean, beans are okay. I'll take beans, but, but <laughs> potted meat, no. Yeah. No, no it's always It's always fascinating when you see that stuff in the uh, grocery store, and it's not refrigerated, and you read the ingredients, you check the expiration date, and you're like, wow, this could be sitting on the shelf for another four years. Yeah, and, it, and it'd be fine, right? Mm-mm-mm. It would be no worse than it was. <laughs> but, but uh, yes, I we do have that show with our esteemed... Uh, friend and colleague and also co-host of a new show called Food Stuff. Yeah. Uh, Lauren Vogelbaum. So do check that out when you get a chance. All right, let's get back to the jungle. <laughs> Welcome to the jungle. <laughs> uh, there are problems uh, with investigating allegations of cryptids in the jungle. Let's take the world's largest tropical rainforest at the time of this recording. It's the Amazon. And it's been the site of hundreds of cryptid sightings or, you know, eyewitness accounts. Here's what makes it tough to hunt for cryptids in a place like the Amazon. The jungle is hungry. It is, it aggressively devours buildings, structures, roads without constant maintenance. Um, it's very difficult to, well, it's very difficult with constant maintenance to keep man-made structures around and viable and without it, boom, the jungle just swallows them up. Yeah, I can totally uh, identify with this because we just had ivy growing, growing in our backyard. And every couple of weeks, I'd have to go back there and take care of it or that thing would just get overrun with just some simple ivy from here in the southeastern United States. Very, uh, certain plants are very motivated. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, kudzu is the legendary example here in the southeast. But... That still has very little on the Amazonian jungle. Entire cities have been lost in the Amazon and only recently found again with the use of sophisticated uh, laser-based surveillance technology like uh, LIDAR, like Noel mentioned earlier. So if if you don't have the resources to go to an isolated place and maintain a life long enough to uh, maintain a structure and a like a an operation long enough to observe this stuff, your chances of seeing anything are, are pretty small, especially if you're looking for something specific. You might be having a needle in a haystack moment. And given the vast biodiversity, it's also possible that people who believe they've seen a cryptid are misidentifying another known creature. Here's a question. You guys know that movie Anaconda where yeah. the snake eats yeah. uh, uh, John, John Voight. Voight. Is yeah. that a spoiler? Yep. Is it? Yep. Oh, what? A snake? A, a movie with the name Anaconda has a snake in it? Well, no, a giant snake, but specifically <laughs> the character. I didn't say what it did after it ate John Boy. That's the twist. Oh, it but see, now, now you... <sighs> Dude, we've been over this. Statue of Limitations. It's a crap yeah. movie anyway. Come on. Uh, Don't mess with it. No, my question, though, is, like, yeah. would an absurdly large version of a known species be considered a cryptid? Yeah, I would I would argue yes, because um, it would be... It's It's an interesting question. So is it an individual that's a very large anaconda, or is it a group of anacondas? That are that are growing, and reptiles are weird too because some reptiles will just continue to grow, just spooky stuff. Yeah, but I I think I you know that's a good question. I would say I want to throw that to the listeners too. So, ladies, gentlemen, and cryptids, if you're in the audience, uh, let us know what you think is is a outsized, a, a very large version of a known animal. Does that count as a cryptid? I would say I'm tempted to say yes. I don't you can know a think. cryptid operate the internet? Oh boy! So it, it, you can if it's encrypted. <laughs> oh, all right, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm leaving right now. So, despite the difficulty in establishing a research outpost and the ease of misidentification, new species are still being found in the world's forests and jungles. Yeah, in May of 2017, researchers found a brand new primate in Angola. Think about that—a brand new primate. That is a large animal. Uh... It's not huge. But it's at least, you know, it's larger than a little bird. They're literally calling it the pygmy galago. So? (laughs) Well, that means they're calling it a pygmy. It's not like some ironic little John thing or something. It's It's, small. Yeah, it's only 6.5 inches long. So it isn't a large animal, just a undiscovered one. Sure. 
But, you know, one person 6.5 inches when you think about microbes and you think about insects. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm still saying it's big. Yeah, it's big, but it's not labradoodle. Okay, you're right, you're right. Big. But you're right. Uh, let's let's continue our search. Let's visit some other biomes. What about mountains and deserts? Okay, let's get this one out of the way. Deserts are some of the most brutal locations in the entire world. On this planet, if you're in a desert, there's not much worse places you can be to to live as an animal. You got to put up with a whole lot of stuff. You have to adapt like crazy. Deserts aren't always hot. Uh, like think about the empty quarter in Saudi Arabia or uh, part of the parts of the Sahara Desert, which most people think of. Uh, you know, those are those are hot deserts, but Antarctica has desert uh, in it. Yes, if living was a video game. Deserts would be the stages that count as hard mode. Oh, for sure. So temperature is not the primary defining trait of a desert. Uh, an area with little vegetation is a desert. Uh, and fewer species of animals exist in deserts in comparison to other biomes. Uh, one famous cryptid described uh, in the deserts of Mongolia is the Mongolian death worm, which yeah. I went through a phase. I was totally obsessed with this thing. Yeah, man. It sounds like a sandworm type thing, but... Is that like the guys from Tremors? Remember Tremors? With it's kind of like a... Yeah, it's kind of like a, a smaller version of that, but they think... The people say that it can spit acid or is coated with some sort of acid. Mm. But, Yum. But I, I, you know, it's a very remote area, but it's it's tough to think that there hasn't been one found, you know, unless it's... Maybe its body is completely cartilaginous. So when it dies, it doesn't leave anything. Right. That's a possibility. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just returns back to the sand. Mm-hmm. To the sand from which it came. So cryptids are, pro- a large cryptid is probably not located in the desert. Mountains are a different story. Some animals thrive in the heights. And although we know they exist, it's tough to find them. Like, it's exceedingly rare for human beings to get a glimpse of the Himalayan snow leopard. Which is a real thing. Yeah. yeah, It, it, it exists, and they're lurking out there. But w- the times that they come out, uh, you know, it's, there aren't humans around a lot of times. They're very wary of other animals. Mm-hmm. And they're pretty well camouflaged, right? And isn't, isn't aren't they designed more or less to blend in with, you know, heavy snows? Designed. Yeah. Design intelligently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is one of the places where there are heavily region-based reports of the abominable snow folk, the Yeti. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, it's so isolated, right? When you're when you're talking about mm-hmm. the Himalayan mountains, uh, new types of bears and goats. But not all mountains are created equally, you know. So. Uh, you're absolutely right about the Himalayas. We also would have to consider, you know, more thoroughly explored mountains in Western Europe probably don't have any large unidentified animals because that area is so heavily populated by humans, mm-hmm. comparatively speaking. But there's another more exciting thing. We're talking about mountains, deserts. We have a very special case, caves. So I was thinking before when we talked about how there's probably not a large undiscovered animal in you know, the Sahara or a sand desert, uh, what I should have said was on the surface because caves are a very special case. They're often removed from the planet's main source of energy, the sun. Uh, we're big fans of planet Earth. We, I th- we mentioned that earlier oh, yeah. in the show, yeah. right? Um, in the episode on caves, one thing that's very interesting, the original planet Earth, is they talk about how The entire ecosystem is supported by guano, uh, by, you know, uh, bat. (laughs) I guess still stick with Tuckus. The straight bat poop. (laughs) Straight bat poop. Uh, because they fly out and, uh, eat creatures or eat things that grow in accordance with sunlight and other, uh, other parts of the food chain. And so now the subterranean system is one step further. Uh, away from the source of energy. And this deficit of available energy would ordinarily mean no large creature could exist, but there's another option to consider. The Earth's internal heat source, the energy that powers geysers and volcanoes. There hasn't been a large living cryptid discovered in cave systems, at least not yet, but we do know for sure the world beneath our feet teems with undiscovered, 
very strange life. As we record this podcast, spelunkers and scholars alike are still discovering extremely strange creatures thousands of feet beneath the ground. And yeah, a lot of them are blind, like just no eyes, atrophy, yeah. spooky, spooky stuff. Well, it's a difficult thing to get down very far into the earth. It's not easy to do, and it takes a lot of equipment and specialized training to do that. So you can't just have a mass search, you know, throughout the the globe I mean, in a bunch of caves. Up, everything will cave cave in. Well, that's that a possibility. Can, you know, uh, flooding. Intended. There are all kinds yeah, of that's a good point. dangers. One of the most dangerous uh, pursuits, actually, is cave diving. Ooh. And uh, apparently, there are still pockets of caverns that are only accessible through a long underwater route. Mm-hmm. And then these these ecosystems within these caverns function kind of like uh, – did you ever see – did you guys ever see those little glass balls that have, like, plants growing in them and their own water mm-hmm, system? Mm-hmm. It, it functions like that in sort of a bubble or in an envelope, and uh, it's completely possible that something lives there. But when we're speaking of things that look very alien to us normal, us surface walkers, us day walkers – we have one big area left to explore, and we'll get to it after a word from our sponsor. So I alluded to this earlier in the show is one of my favorite episodes of Planet Earth. Uh, of all of the ecosystems on this planet, the ocean gives us the best odds for discovering a large cryptid like a Godzilla. Um, experts believe that we've explored uh, going on 5% of the world's seabed. And to many experts and amateurs alike, this vast unknown stretch of the world um, poses the greatest possibility of discovering new large animals um, to wit sea monsters. Yeah, man. And we've been finding some of these things over the years. It, you know, just in the recent past, We found the colossal squid. We found a whale that had a beak. Now, it wasn't wasn't really a beak, but it was the beaked whale. Yeah. And then uh, there were, we we know there are other things to discover. So you've probably, if you're a fan of this show, that means you have probably, like us, gone down the rabbit hole before where you look up mysterious carcasses washed ashore. Uh, Noel pointed out earlier that uh, whales wash ashore pretty often. And Matt, you and I have talked about this off air. A lot of those carcasses look radically different from a living whale and have often been misidentified as something else. But even with that being said, there are genuine accounts of experts not being able to identify the thing that washed up and just saying, ah, we don't know. Maybe it's some kind of deep sea Lovecraftian shark. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's a, a Pacific Rim style kaiju. I don't know, man. Maybe it got dislodged when a ship sank or something. <laughs> Who knows? And just like life in cave systems, there's one big objection to the idea of a large creature living in the deep. That is energy. So we talked about some of those really strange, like deep sea angler fish and tiny, um, tiny octopoid looking things. Uh, the truth of the matter is that at the abyssal plain, under that immense pressure that Matt mentioned, Animals are going to tend to be smaller as a rule, Mm. and they're also further away from that source of energy, sunlight. But also similar to the cave idea, we do know of one very bizarre feature of the ocean floor, geothermal vents. So these geothermal vents uh, emit intense heat from the Earth, and they act as a kind of underwater oasis um, for extremophiles and just possibly other larger forms of life. So this means, to steal a line from Dumb and Dumber, we're saying there's a chance. Yep. <laughs> there is a chance that there's large, undiscovered life. Uh, not a very good chance. Not not really good odds if you're gambling. But if something large and undiscovered exists, it almost certainly would have to exist in the ocean. Yeah, and it'd have to be able to hide or at least conceal itself in some way to evade all of the different tracking techniques that we have where you can look at the bottom of the ocean floor, anything that is existing there, the, the, uh, fishing, the technology that large fisheries use, Mm -hmm. you can 
you can see what's on the bottom of the floor. And then there's, this is just a, a brainstorm thing. It's entirely speculation on my part. But there is a possibility that other forms of life would be discovered in the deep by militaries using submarines. And mm-hmm. then they would choose not to reveal it because doing so would also reveal the technology they use to find the thing. Like at the certain level that they're at, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where they're able to, or maybe even where they're operating. Right, right. Like what is this? What what is this Russian sub doing in the Indian Ocean? Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, so that and that's purely speculation on my part. That might as well be the plot for a dime store novel. Or something. Writing it down. You should hop on that, Ben. I should I should in general hop more often? Yeah, and I think you're selling it short. Dime store? No, that is that is a, a potential bestseller. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> The collapse of oceanic ecosystems, uh, as we said, the the key here is that this becomes a time-sensitive pursuit. Humanity's explorers are racing against humanity's pollution. So if something big exists out there, it's also tragically likely that it will be extinct before we actually see it. Jeez. That's That's a tough thought. We've all seen images, I'm assuming, of, is it the Pacific trash thing? Oh, what is the it? trash vortex? Yeah, and all that. I mean, that's just, it's hard to know that that's happening. And in some way, I guess we're all just contributing to that. Yikes. It's okay, our time will come. Yeah. It feels like it's getting here. What goes around comes around. Oh, ooh. I like I like both of those things. Like a, like a trash vortex. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But see, I feel like a rose without a thorn, so I'm trying to figure out why <laughs> this would happen to all of us. We hope that you enjoyed this exploration, and if you are interested in cryptozoology, please do check out our earlier videos and podcasts. We have a very special announcement for you at the end of the show, a little bit of a teaser, if you will. But before that, enough about us. What about you? Shout out corner. Our first shout out today comes from Jenna, who wrote to us after watching Etched in Secret, our Georgia Guidestones documentary on Amazon. If you haven't seen it yet, do it now. Uh, Jenna had some very interesting ideas about the future of humanity, but more importantly, she had a fantastic episode suggestion. So Jenna says, a person I think would be interesting to explore in a podcast is the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski. He convinced the FBI to publish his manifesto against the system in the Washington Post. It is the single day when the most newspapers were sold. So he would stop the bombs being sent through the mail. He convinced the FBI to publish his manifesto against the system in the Washington Post. And that happened to be the day when they sold the most newspapers to that point. And that's what, what she says. I'm not, I haven't, we haven't confirmed that independently, but it wouldn't surprise me if that were very close to the case. And he did this so that he would Basically, he held them hostage, more or less, so that he right. would stop sending bombs in the mail if they would agree to publish his manifesto. Um, it led to his arrest, and his court-appointed attorneys wanted to plead insanity, so Kaczynski fired them and wanted to speak for himself. Um, he did have several degrees, though none were in law, um, yet he was forced into a plea deal because the FBI didn't want the public to see how logical he was. Interesting perspective. Um, he now has several books published. On a side note, it was three guns that killed JFK. Okay. All right. No, no further okay, explanation Jeff. there. <laughs> uh, thanks for the great podcast and thanks for the interesting perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a very interesting point that I think would make a, a, a good a topic for examination in an episode. It let us know if you agree with Jenna and would like us to delve into uh, the biography of the Unabomber along with his motivations and legal proceedings because he very much does believe there is stuff they don't want you to know. Our next shout-out goes out to Danara, who sent us a message to, quote, chime in, oh, excuse me, chime in about... Our serial killers on the loose part two episode, uh, specifically about the Oakland County child. Killer. Oh, yeah, I remember this one. OK, so Dinar says, my memories are fuzzy, but I grew up in Detroit. My dad had been a D.A., a district attorney in Wayne County. That's Detroit City. Oakland County is the next county to the north. 
I was about eight years old when the killings took place. We never once called him the babysitter. The grown-ups called him, quote, the snow killer, because they always found the kids posed as snow angels the night after a new snowfall. Us kids called him the snow angel, mostly in whispers. My dad and his family were staunchly Catholic. Grandfather did PR, public relations work, for the diocese for free. Dad did legal work for the diocese also for free. This matters because Dad was having a conversation with one of the cops involved, and this subject came up. The cop was spitting mad because they knew who did it, and they couldn't touch him. Oh, okay, that's news to me. He was a Catholic priest. Dad didn't believe it. Neither did Grandfather. Okay, uh, that just uh, pulling out of the listener mail really fast. I had not seen that uh, anywhere in the research. No, I hadn't either. Uh, but that's, you know, fascinating. I'm going to look into that now. We're going back in. The priest got hit by a car and died and the killings stopped. Once the snow started falling the next year and there were no bodies, dad said we didn't have to go to church anymore. Grandfather had stopped going over the summer and they both cut off all contact with the Catholic clergy, even their best friends. Neither of them ever talked about it. Jeez. Okay, so on top of his legal career, Dad wrote books, crime novels. When he found out he was dying, he started writing The Snow Killer. And unfortunately, he died before finishing it. Jeez. This is this is fascinating information. Thank you for writing in, Denaro, because we didn't find in the course of the research we were doing uh, information about a Catholic priest being involved. No, not at all. And a lot of that stuff, I never saw the snow killer mentioned in any of the uh, articles that were written at the time. Mm. So, I don't know. News to me. Thank you so much for writing in. We have one more shout out today. It is to Brent. Brent says, guys, just listen to the Red Mercury episode. Uh, a couple of points. You mentioned the possibility of Red Mercury being a code name for something else. There is a precedent for this in the nuclear community. During World War II, uranium was always referred to by the code name copper. So how did they refer to Element 29, actual copper? It was honest-to-God copper. <laughs> also, you're right, buying a pig in a poke is buying something sight unseen, often a dog or a cat rather than an actual pig. Thus, inadvertently revealing the scam was letting the cat out of the bag. Whoa. Keep it going. Thank you for the etymology uh, lessons there, Brent. That's pretty awesome. Talk about connecting dots. Yeah, I think we're going to stick stick with Badger Stone. <laughs> <laughs> I've never no. bought a dog in a bag. No. Or a pig. Noel is nodding in a very, like, sympathetic way right now. Well, I mean, I don't know. It just seems like a real stretch to agree to buying a creature sight unseen. I mean, what if it turns out to be some sort of bizarre acid-spitting cryptid that, you know, as soon as you open that <laughs> oh, drawstring, yeah. it jumps right out and, yeah. you know, melts your face off with its uh, acid venom. Somehow. We should make a PSA. Ooh. <laughs> we should do a PSA against buying things, uh... Buying things in bags without looking inside the bag. The funny thing is I have a kid, and there's a big thing that kids love these days is these little things you buy, these little trinkets where you don't know what's in it. It's like it looks like a little yogurt cup, Mm. and it's got this little like an Asian kind of trinket that's a stamp or a lip balm or something like that. And the whole joy of it is in not knowing what it is. But at least you know that it's not going to eat your face off. Yeah, it's not a living creature. That's, (laughs) That's honestly why I love magic cards. When you buy the packs and you don't know what the rare is. Oh. Maybe one day you'll get a live pig. Oh, I only hope so. Speaking of fantastic segues, this concludes our... <laughs> but not our show. Visit our website, Stuff They Don't Want You To Know, to check out any and all of the episodes that Matt, Noel, and I have done in previous days. Can I do a plug? Yeah, because we got a we've new got a, show. We got, got a new show. show. It's not ours, oh, yeah. but we participated in it. It's um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the wonderful, wonderful publication and website, Mental Floss. Well, the two dudes, Will and Mangas, that actually founded that publication, uh, work for us now. Not us stuff they don't want you to know. Us, you know, the greater how stuff works. Uh, they work with universe. us. They do work with us, and they are lovely, lovely dudes. And they have a new show called Part Time Genius that mm. um, Ben helped editorially with. I did the audio mixing and mm-hmm. the music and sound design. And uh, Tristan, who's producing the show, did the editing. And yeah, and I did some promotional videos You for did it. indeed. We all had <laughs> we our actually all <laughs> fingers in that particular badger pot. It takes a, it takes a village, and uh, we think that you are really going to enjoy the show. The guys worked really hard on it. They are brilliant. Uh, they're far, far too humble, in my mm. opinion. And I used to, funny... 
funny story. I've been a fan for years from the Mental Floss days. And I have an autographed book of theirs. Wow. Nice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's strange, but uh, yeah, the show is out now. Uh, I think they released four episodes, four in one go. So you got Jeez. like some nice material to dig through. They're about forty-five minutes apiece, and there are four on the channel right now. Part time genius on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or anywhere else you get your audio delights. And one warning: if you hear the theme song for Part Time Genius, mm -hmm. it will not leave your ears for many a day. Uh, it is, I made that. It's, yeah, no it's really awesome, dolly. but man, that thing is a jammer. <laughs> so let us know what you think of Part Time Genius. If you like our show, you will love theirs as well. Oh, and, one and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.